thanks for joining us. Trinity's Children, uh, which is book one of the Paradigm 2045 series, um, published right before Dragon Con. Um, it is available on Audible right now. And uh, actually, we put in a special treat for anybody buying the audiobook. You can download a beautiful um, illustrated cover that is signed by the artist and Robert. And you can uh, use that for your wallpaper. So that is a special bonus that is available alongside the audiobook um, on Audible. Robert, uh, Robert Ross is the author of the best selling Sentinels of Creation um, print and audiobook series. His new series, published by Podium Audio, is Paradigm 2045 and represents Robert's first foray into full length science fiction writing. The first of three books, Trinity's Children, was released just in time for this year's Dragon Con. So get the hot buns while they're hot. And Nick, uh, by day, Nick Podell gives voice to a multitude of characters that heretofore only existed on the page. He has narrated a few books, hundreds, over the years and received a few awards um, because of it. So guys, uh, you became friends and creative collaborators long before Podium came along uh, to publish Paradigm for 2045. Um, Tell us how you met. Robert, go for I, it. <laughs> uh, so I, when I wrote um, the, my first series, um, I had I was already a huge fan of audiobooks. Um, so um, I actually wrote it as an audio book series. <clears throat> I guess what that means is that some of the dialogue is a little bit different in, in, in how it uh, is normally kind of processed for, for print. So um, uh, I, I knew that that was something that was really paramount in terms of how I wanted people to consume uh, the, this story. And <clears throat> I was actually a, a big uh, fan of, of Nick's work uh, ahead of time uh, and had actually uh, really thought that, you know, this would be a great opportunity for us to work together, not really thinking that this was, you know, going to happen. Because I... I didn't know how old he was. I didn't know how long he'd been doing it. I just knew that there was a couple of different books that um, I really enjoyed and thought that would resonate well with the characters. Because a lot of my characters do a lot of um, quick banter back and forth, and there's a lot of uh, dialogue between male and female characters. And I think one of uh, Nick's great talents is his ability to, to uh, hold all those people in his head at the same time. It causes all sorts of dysfunctions, mind you. but. <laughs> but it's uh, it's a it's a real gift, and so I, I had written to him uh, just out of the blue, and I said, "Hey, um, would you be interested in doing uh, a book like this?" And I described it to him, uh, and I, I said, "Hey, can you be a Scottish woman?" And he said, "Absolutely, I could be a Scottish woman." Uh, but I'll pause there and let let uh, Nick respond a little bit to that first email. <laughs> So yeah, actually, uh, I went back and looked through some of our early emails here prior to this also, and it's kind of cute how uh, how professional we were back then. And that was, I think, four years ago was the the first stamp because my eldest daughter was ten months at the time, and she's five now. So yeah, almost um, almost five when we started. Yeah, dating. almost five. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and so uh, I had just started uh, fairly recently into the indie author um, realm of producing audiobooks. And um, so I, I liked the descriptions that Robert had given me about his book and the characters sounded a lot of fun. And um, that's that's a big thing for me is like, are the characters going to be fun to give voice to? And so I jumped on it pretty quickly. Um, and I was really thrilled to hear that he was excited about the collaborative nature of the project because, um, you know, some of the, some of the projects that I've worked on, the, the authors are a little bit more, um, I'll, I'll say take a back seat to the, to the audiobook production side. You know, they'll, they'll give a little bit of input or some none. Um, but Robert seemed like, you know, this was something that was really important to him and he wanted to be a part of the process. And so. Um, I really enjoy those collaborative projects, and so I was I was pretty excited. Yeah, the the voices that um, that you you do, Nick, are amazing. I've listened to several of the audiobooks that you've um, you've narrated for Podium, and you you could fool the listener 
into believing that you are a different person. And that's that's such a skill. Actually, I'm looking at the way your face is moving now and you actually have quite an elastic face. I don't know, is that, is that offensive? <laughs> no, no, I mean, maybe somebody would find it offensive, but I don't, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> I think this could be, this could be how, how it happens, how, how you make the Scottish lady sing. <laughs> Thanks for that, Robert. Yeah, yeah. No, you are. <laughs> your ladies are amazing, Nick. Your ladies, your ladies are very lady. Thank um, you. So another, actually, one of our our head of production, Emily, was telling me about how much you prepare for for the the books that you um, you take on, and it's you know it's not a, a light lift. Uh, I've heard that you spend several weeks at least on on each audiobook. So tell us a bit about your your process for preparation and how, you know, whether the author is, you know, super involved um, and giving you um, direction on on how that particular character needs to sound or or if it's just something you, you know, you create out of whole cloth or out of the book. Sure. So uh, it it's dependent entirely on the on the project, the length of the project, but um, with every project that I undertake, I completely read through the manuscript word for word, um, completely all the way through before I even set foot in the booth here. Um, I need to know just everything that is in the book before I can start giving voice to it. Um, and so depending upon how long the book is, will determine how much time I spend in prep before getting into the booth. Once that's done, then I'll usually uh, either reach out to the author um, if, you know, like with Podium, if they provide me with the contact information or go over the materials that they've been given um, that they will then send on to me for any notes on characters, like if they have specific accents in mind or if there's, you know, tonal qualities that they want included in those characters so that I can keep those notes with me as I'm recording. Um, in the case of working with Robert, you know, he and I, um, you know, we started before the collaboration with Podium and um, we would go back and forth with uh, with different character samples. Like we would try four or five different Kellens and then six different Shannons. And he would say, like, uh, I I liked this of number six, but can you include the speed of number three? And. Um, you know, a much more involved process, but I think that it, in the end, it makes for a much better final project because we just got more ears on the project. And I think that that's, that's a huge thing with audiobooks. Um, you know, and I've done the ones where I don't get a lot of feedback from an author or some, or, you know, um, a content provider or something like that. And it's still really good. Um, it's just, it doesn't have that same polish that, say, something like this would have where there's more more creative juices flowing back and forth. Yeah, I think that's especially uh, important for if something's going to be a series and uh, and multiple, you know, significant number of books. Um, the first book's so critical because you can't really change the voices afterwards. Um, I've, I've experienced it a few times when, for whatever reason, the series had to change um, either narrators, which is the worst, or they just didn't go back and check how the voices were done um and uh, people really don't like that because they get they get invested in these characters and they know what they're supposed to sound like and uh, they are not shy about letting you know that um that you did that wrong not just in how you voice them uh or how someone voices them uh but how you write them as well they're not not shy at all uh, audiobook them. fans are they're they're rabid yeah some of our our authors have told me that when they're writing sort of book 12 in a series, the audiobooks are great because they can, they'll just go back to the beginning and, and listen to, you know, the series in audio. And then that helps them with their consistency with writing the next book in the series. Um, Robert, did you, did you give Nick a, any particular challenge uh, in, in this series? Were you, did you uh, write particular characters just because you know his skills so well? Um, yeah, well, the, 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 the real thing that he does better, I think, than anybody is, is be able, being able to on the fly uh, switch between characters um, and have so many of them uh, discussing something. 
And again, that's really, uh, my, my books are very dialogue heavy. If you remember the television show Moonlighting from, I'm dating myself from the, I guess the 90s. Um, <laughs> they, they, they were, they, they went out as thick, they were sort of the largest scripts. Their scripts were like this. And so so my books are like that when it comes to, to dialogue. So <clears throat> I remember when I, when I started thinking about um, Paradigm 2045 with, with Podium, the only thing that I knew was the first two characters, um, and and uh, and it was the second of the of those two that was most intriguing to me, uh, Charlotte Amandi, who's the main character. I knew, I knew that she was a Kenyan woman, so I was like, "Hey, Nick, um, my next book's going to be a Kenyan. The Kenyan woman is a main character." And his first reaction was, "Good luck on finding your narrator. <clears throat> I don't do Kenyan women accents. I've never done a Kenyan accent." I was like, "Oh no, there's plenty of guys in this book, and you will be doing it." So that was the first challenge. And I remember when we first got it started, he said, so what, what is this, what is she going to sound like? And so we started doing a whole bunch of different video clips of these different women uh, with these beautiful Kenyan accents. Um, and uh, I think he did an amazing job. So, but that was, that was the main uh, challenge for that one, I guess. And singing Sinatra, I made him sing Sinatra. I always try to throw something in each book that tortures him. Um, and, um, and this time it was, uh, it was singing Sinatra. Yep. You're going to have to raise the bar for book two. I know, right? What's next? I yeah. almost don't want something. to know. <laughs> something. Belching happy birthday or something. Oh, I have to learn to burp on command. <laughs> oh, too funny. Um, Robert, tell us a little bit about the story of Trinity's Children and the larger Paradigm 2045 series. Sure. Um, so I, I kind of described Paradigm 2045 is if uh, Battlestar Galactica, The Expanse, and Ready Player One had a baby, um, it would be this series. And it's a near future sci-fi um, set in the year 2045, cleverly written. Um, and it it's about uh, 100 years past when the Trinity nuclear test was done, which got the attention of some folks in the, uh, galact the galactic community. Uh, and they gave us a uh, hundred years to resolve some issues, which of course we didn't necessarily know that that clock was ticking. And the series takes place really the last few months before uh, the um, the June 2045 anniversary of that that uh, Trinity nuclear test. Uh, so it's a it's a bit of a, a, a an amalgam of uh, of folks that come together as part of this um, this ensemble cast, uh, ranging from a uh, a Kenyan woman who's uh, leading that crew to a, a jaunty Irishman and a Scandinavian communications officer, a Russian security officer, all sorts of really interesting people, all voiced to perfection by the very one and only Nick Podell. Ah. I, yeah, I try to make him embarrassed. So that's it in a, in a nutshell, uh, uh, Trinity's Children's first book of uh, Paradigm series. And when you've just listed uh, the diverse characters that you have in the book, and actually I see the artwork over your shoulder uh, there, um, sported nicely. Um, and you were, when you were thinking about the characters that you, you were putting in the book, were you thinking about Nick's performance of them? Yeah, it's really interesting because Nick and I have been uh, together for quite a number of years. And um, I, after the first couple of books we've done together, I start to hear how he'll voice them in my head while I'm writing. Um, and um, it actually changes significantly um, how I write because I always wrote for audiobooks, uh, which changes the dialogue approach and how you use different words and whether or not you have lots of saids and things like that in there because you can start to roll that dialogue as if it's, um, as if it's more of a, of, a, of a film that you're watching uh, just without visuals. Um, but uh, so I start to hear him in my head, and which is you know strange, obviously. But but uh, it changes the um, the cadence with which I write. Um, and <clears throat> I actually my my daughter has told me how strange I look when I'm writing because I was writing next to the fireplace uh, earlier in the winter. And so I actually apparently I don't know this, but I, my lips will be moving as I'm writing, and I make some odd facial expressions, which are very similar to what we just saw Nick do earlier. Um, <laughs> And so I'm hearing him in my head talking, mumbling with very bad, very, very bad accents um, that uh, are a, a faint approximation of what he's doing. Um, because once the characters get in your head, they, they, take, they, they really take on uh, a life of their own. 
Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of the difference when uh, when I'm working on a book that I've already done with them. So it's a lot harder. That first book is a lot harder. Um, but fortunately, we were I was actually when I was doing Trinity's Children, we were doing some prep work for my last Sentinels book. So I still had all those voices in my head, and there was some translation happening. And were there particular scenes that you put in to give him a special challenge? Yeah, there's a there's um there is a scene um in uh, a, a shuttlecraft where the um, the Irish character um, uh, is um, is being is taunting the uh, the Russian the female Russian, and he um, he slips into a uh, an accent uh, and uh, of Frank Sinatra uh, from a from a song from Come Fly with Me, uh, which you know, fly annoys me to her. The moon. That's fly right. Me fly to me to the moon. moon. I don't even know my own writing. Uh, fly me to the moon, uh, and um, and so he uh, uh, he slipped into that, and um, and I try to do that in each one of my books. I think I may have mentioned that a little earlier. As I try to throw something in there that's either a treat uh, or a taunt. Uh, we were we were one day we were we were working on something together, and for some reason, um, uh, Nick slipped into um, the Beatles talking to each other, and I do accents too. I just do them horribly. Um, so we do these accents back and forth to each other. He's just a professional and I'm a, a, a hack. So, so after he did that, I was like, huh, that's interesting. So I wrote this whole scene like 15 minutes later of where the characters met the Beatles. Uh, and then he got to do uh, Paul and Ringo, uh, which I think he enjoyed. Doing. So that was, was the treat. The, uh, the penance, the penance was when I had him uh, sing as a Scottish woman uh, and an American woman doing a duet with each other. So, Whoa. so that was, uh, that was penance for something. I don't know. I don't it know. Painful. It but it turned out. Was it? Was it? it was painful. It was painful. Is that, is that it was great. Trin is that in Trinity's Children, or is that in one of the Sentinels books? No, that's in one of the one of the Sentinels books because um, it's harder to actually do um, uh, to do lyrical voicing um, with you guys because uh, people care more about your your productions than than more independent ones. So you more, more people want to sue you. Okay. <laughs> no copyright infringement. No copyright infringement. Nothing was done. Nothing was done. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. We, I don't know. It was on the cutting room floor. Cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. yes. Director's cut right there. <laughs> That's right. It's a director's cut. I think yeah. I think we ended up we ended up having to re-record that one. So there's a there's a bootleg version of him singing Sinatra, but we had him him voicing it with a bit of a lilt in the final production version. Yep. <laughs> Very smart. You guys clearly have a great vibe together. I'm surprised there's time for either one of you to do anything else. <laughs> like, no, we make the time. We, we, you make we, time. We do end up going, got to go. And then like half hour okay. later, it's like, we really got to go. Okay. okay. Well, let me <laughs> ask you, Nick. So you, this is the second series that you got, you've collaborated with Robert on. Um, what made this series unique for you? Um, it had all of the elements that I really enjoy about Robert's writing, which is um, the biggest one is the banter between characters. And so he he stayed true to form with that one. And I'm so glad that that was still a major part of this new series. Um, I think the, the biggest one is one that we've touched on is the diversity of all of the main characters. And the fact that like with um, with his previous series, there are a bunch of various different characters but the um, the the main ones have a certain amount of cohesiveness. You know, they're they're all from um, largely they're all from Atlanta, minus the Scottish gal. But with um, Paradigm, they are from all over the world, and they're all coming together. And so it's this just rapid fire back and forth with the dialogue of people from very disparate areas and trying to keep all of those accents straight in the recording booth. It's definitely challenging at times. We we you know make it through and yay, Pro Tools helps with uh, vocal <laughs> cues and reminders. But uh, it, it definitely was a challenge. It's a mind a mind twister. Mm -hmm. You get extra danger money for that. <laughs> yeah, right. I got. I had some some folks question. It was really fun, kind of funny because um, in this kind of moment that we're living all living in, I got a question um, like, did you did you write this book? Because of some of the some of the things that we're we're all discussing now more than more than ever, and I was like, yeah, I managed to write 170,000 words uh, in the last uh, month, 
so no, I mean, it really, it really was just, um, you know, I, I've been blessed with having some really interesting and diverse teams in, in some of my professional work. And um, the, 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 the thematic in this paradigm uh, universe, uh, and it's going, it goes throughout the book a couple of different times, is e pluribus unum, which is both the, the motto of the United States, but I really wanted to, to uh, highlight this out, out, of the, out of the many one. So these, these folks coming from, from Russia and from Kenya, uh, uh, from, from Norway, uh, Ireland, et cetera, um, they're all very, very different people, very different backgrounds. But, but in order for humanity to survive, which is the, the main co uh, conflict of the book, they have to stop being those individuals in, solely and become something new together. Um, and that was really the thematic for the whole book. Um, so I can't take any credit for, uh, for being responsive to the world we live in now. It's more just uh, serendipity, I think. It's certainly a message that we all need and mm -hmm. we want right now. So timing is perfect. Your timing is excellent, Robert. I wish I could take credit. <laughs> <laughs> you can be inspired.